was asked to talk about Mariology, I was um, I started thinking I will only talk about uh, a few things like the Immaculate Conception. Uh, but as is uh, the case with anything Catholic, you, you can't really isolate one teaching and just kind of expect um, other things to ta uh, to stand. So uh, I'll try and make this really quick. So I am. Um, the uh, the Marian dogmas. I'll make it really quick, but I do want to say like two or three stories um, that uh, things I've heard, things uh, from the Bible, uh, that kind of thing. You know, so um, so if you guys are okay with that, that'll be great. Uh, so we'll just start with a quick prayer. Just if you guys can pray for me, uh, maybe in your hearts or something. Well, I'll just pray a quick Hail Mary. So Hail Mary, in the name of the Father and the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Mother Mary, please. Uh, uh, we, we pray that uh, you ask your son to send the Holy Spirit into us, the Holy Spirit that lived in you, that conceived the word made flesh in you. Mother Mary, we ask you that uh, to help us open our hearts, open ourselves uh, to the word of God like you did, a complete docility and faith to say yes and to believe what the church teaches, what the bride of your son teaches about you. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and the hour of our death. Amen. Amen. Can I get a watch? I'll tell you the time. Okay, I got it here. So, so uh, the thing with... Um, the thing with any teaching of the Catholic Church is that, um, like, there are certain core things. You see, yeah, that needs to be assumed as true, or yeah, we need to believe that to actually believe other things. So, the Catholic teaching on Mariology, um, I could be completely wrong here, like, you know, but uh, it's not the thing that's like specific for salvation, but it really does help, you know. So, uh, and it really does kind of who Mary is, uh, kind of really helps us understand who Jesus is. And vice versa. So, um, thank you. Um, so here's the thing. I put this. Uh, yesterday was the feast of the Nativity of Mary, um, uh, the Mother of God. So I just put in Ave Maria Gra Gracia Plena, Gra Gracia Plena. Yeah, and Cacare uh, Tumene. So I'll kind of explain this uh, somewhere near the end at some point. Uh, so that's something. I hope that's interesting. So. I can move the slides now. No, you just do this. Press this. Press this. Okay. So uh, this is something I found yesterday. It was uh, it was on one of my fr uh, friends Kevin's um, WhatsApp status. I thought this was great, like you know, this cartoon. So just uh, Mary and Joe, uh, sorry, Jesus and Joseph, uh, singing happy birthday and going hail Mary, something along those lines. So anyway, uh, just press this. Just press anyway. So the core dogmas of the Catholic Church, there, are a, uh, there, there might be some things that I have omitted here, but basically the thing starts with this, how God revealed himself. So he said there was only one God, God said, there was only one of him, you know, and he's all powerful, all, um, all, all he's present everywhere, to everyone, to everything. He, he's all knowing, he's, um, he's all good. So he's just all of those things. So, but there's only one of him. There's only one God. Then the, the next revelation was there's three persons. So it's the, and the, the relationship is as the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And, um, and that's their identity. They're the God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. Then there's the, uh, b just before that, actually, uh, it is God who created everything. It's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who created everything. Uh, but um, man who was uh, at, the, uh, at the pinnacle of material creation, he, um, uh, he fell and in in that way not just uh, like everything was thrown out of balance not just man himself but all of creation was thrown out of balance so that's part of the story and so something called the incarnation happened so the second person of the trinity god the son became man now uh, to save man and to renew creation now the next part is salvation by grace so uh, the second person in the Trinity became Jesus, the man, and uh, he saved everyone. He has uh, worked, uh, he's finished his work of salvation uh, and through his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. All right. It's his whole life uh, that saves us. All right. And, uh, but it didn't happen straight away. For example, uh, like in the Bible, the, uh, the fall happens in the third chapter. And it's like, I don't know, thousands of years later that Jesus comes and you're 
bound to ask God, like, what are you doing? Like, you know, you could have saved him then. But uh, again, he did it in the, as they say, fullness of time. So um, anyway, so that's what happened. And, uh, and, but all those things that happened in between, he wasn't just kind of sitting around like, you know, ah, we'll see, you know, but there was something being worked. He was working towards this. He was preparing people towards this. All right. And then the, uh, the last thing I, uh, it's important for today is actually divine revelation that sacred scripture and sacred tradition are both part of the divine word of God. Sacred scripture is the written uh, uh, stuff like written by the apostles, written by the, uh, people and that's been recorded in the Bible and sacred tradition is the oral teaching of the apostles, both of which are important. All right, so these are things that I'm assuming all of us believe and if not, for the sake of this Kind of discussion this kind of zoom meeting uh if you guys can kind of take all of this as true that would be great so now the four great marian dogmas uh these are the things i'm hoping i kind of fly through them but uh eh, i just forgive me if i don't okay there's so much interconnectedness there uh as is with it's like um it's like the marvel cinematic universe like you know hawkeye appears in thor and then like um what, what else has happens iron man appears in um What's his face? Uh, Spider Man. All of those things, like you know, and Spider Man appears in the Civil War. Like, eh, eh, like things are always connected there. So um, now uh, the uh, the four great Marian dogmas are: uh, Mary is the mother of God. She's the Theo Tokos. Uh, Theo means God. Tokos means bearer. She's the God bearer. Uh, she is the immaculate conception. She was immaculately conceived. Uh, she. Uh, um, Mary was perpetually a virgin and she was bodily assumed into heaven. So, whew, that's, that's it. Oh, sorry, I meant to say this actually. The uh, poster for this, uh, uh, poster for this actually mentioned that uh, there were three questions that would be answered. So what were they? Is Mary, uh, what was that? Who is Mary? I'll just answer that really quickly before I go any further. So who is Mary? Mary is the mother of Jesus, who is God. Uh, why is Mary important? Because she's the mother of Jesus, who is God. And uh, do we worship Mary? Do Catholics worship Mary? No. And that's it. I, I, if that's the whole kind of talk about, like, we finished it. But I just wanted to kind of elaborate on things as I like to do. So here we go. So first of all, who is Jesus? So Jesus is uh, the second person of the Trinity. He's God the Son. He's the Word made flesh, as it says in John 1. He's the bread that came down from heaven. He's the great high priest. He's the son of David. He's the promise of God. He's fully God, fully man. He's the king of creation and so much more. You know, the, these are all the things that uh, I think would be relevant for this. All right. So, and I've given like uh, biblical verses for certain things that might be confusing. So he's all of these things, all right? He's also the new Adam, the new Noah, the new Isaac, the new Moses, and the new son of David. Okay. All of the old covenants, he fulfills them. All right. And uh, now the, that's a thing called typology where you can see the, the incarnation being foreshadowed, the story of Jesus being foreshadowed in all of the, in a lot of the Old Testament characters and stories. So now the next question is, who is Mary? Uh, she is the mother of Jesus. And as we said before, uh, yeah, Jesus is God the Son. So uh, is the mother of Jesus, therefore the mother of God. Um, she was overshadowed by the power of the Most High. In Luke, uh, during the Annunciation, uh, Mary, um, uh, the angel kind of tells her, um, uh, when Mary asks, how can this be? I will, I, I'm a, for I'm a virgin. And uh, the angel goes, uh, fear not, you, nothing is impossible for God. You will be overshadowed by the power of the Most High and you will bear a son. Now, so uh, he's, she's also the mother of my Lord. So this is something uh, Elizabeth says uh, when Mary is kind of, um, Mary travels to the hill country of Judea um, uh, immediately after the Annunciation because she hears that her cousin is also pregnant and her cousin's a really old woman, so she definitely needs some help. So she kind of just runs over there uh, and as soon as Elizabeth sees her, the, the child inside her womb just jumps and dances and Elizabeth just goes. Uh, uh, so the Holy Spirit fills the child inside Elizabeth's womb uh, and Elizabeth goes, who should I be? that the mother of my Lord should come to me. Who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Okay, these two things are important later on. Now, she's also the woman, you know, in um, what's the first thing Jesus is recorded as calling 
Mary, you know, uh, in the Gospel of John. It's when mm -hmm. uh, she, uh, uh, he meets her in, uh, in, in the Gospel when Mary tells Jesus that the wine is finished and uh, Jesus goes, woman. Yeah, what is it to you and me? You know, so uh, she refer, he refers to her as the woman. All right. So uh, in Revelation 12, there is another woman mentioned who bears a child who is supposed to rule the nations with a scepter of iron. So if you go all through the Bible, Revelation is the last book. If you read all through the Bible, at that point, it should be clear that the child who is supposed to rule the world with the scepter of iron is God himself, is God the Son. So, and the person who God, the person who gave birth to God the Son is Mary. Uh, that's the woman. And, uh, and she's also the Ark of the Covenant. Okay. So the last three points kind of point her towards a point towards her being the Ark of the Covenant. So I'm just gonna like take a hard left turn and we'll just talk about something completely different. We're gonna talk about the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, oh, that's uh, an icon of the Theotokos. So it's Mary with Jesus inside her as a tiny baby or a man, like, like with a man's face, I guess, I don't know. So, okay, thank you. Uh, so the Ark of the Covenant. So. In, in Exodus 16 and Exodus 25, there are three things. Okay, I just have to say, uh, do a quick sidebar and say a lot of these things, almost all of it, I learned from Giorgio. And, uh, and then I've listened to other authors. So if you want more information on it, you can just type in YouTube, Mary, the Ark of the Covenant, and you'd get like so much better talks and like, you know, from theologians, philosophers, uh, really knowledgeable men. Uh, so I'm just adapting all of their stuff. So... Uh, just if you feel like I'm going too fast on this, I, I'm not making the case here. Just kind of listen to any of those things or, uh, and there are books about it too. So I'm just going to make quick points here. So the Ark of the Covenant had three things inside it. It carried the Ten Commandments, okay, which was the written word of God. God himself wrote those Ten Commandments on the stone tablets that was put in the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, it also carried the rod of Aaron, uh, which represented the priesthood, all right? And it carried the manna right, which was the bread that came down from heaven that God gave. Now, guess what Mary carried? Mary, the new Ark of the Covenant, carried the bread of life that came down from heaven. You know, Jesus himself said, I'm the bread of life. He who eats me will have eternal life. Uh, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. All of those things in John 6. Now, uh, Mary also carried the great high priest in Hebrew, like I said here, sorry, Oh, yeah. here. Uh, so Jesus is the word made flesh. Uh, he's, he is the word of God made flesh, as John 1 says. And uh, he is also the bread that came down from heaven, as John 6 says. And he is the great high priest, uh, as Hebrews 4 says. So if Jesus represents all of those things from the Old Testament in a more um, real manner, because he's a person and he's the bread of life, he's the great high priest in the word made flesh, Mary the old, the old Ark of the Covenant was just a box, all right? Mary is the new Ark of the Covenant, and she's a person, all right? Now, there are other things about the old Ark of the Covenant. Oh, this was a picture I found. It's a monstrance, so it's used for adoration, for those of you who don't know, and it's actually in the shape of the Ark of the Covenant, but it's Mary on top of the mercy seat. So, uh, now, May, uh, the, Ark of the, the old Ark of the Covenant was made out of uh, acacia wood and pure gold. It was made out of beaten gold. So if you want more um, information on that, Exodus, 15, uh, Exodus 16 and 25 uh, gives a lot of information. All, all of that is about how the Ark of the Covenant was made. And God put so much care into asking them to make it. He gives them very precise instructions. He tells them to use a specific kind of wood, a specific, uh, specific kind of gold, all of those kind of things, you know. And uh, it's made to be pure. So it's supposed to, what's supposed to happen later on is actually um, the glory of the Lord comes down on top of the mercy seat, all right, which was the top of the Ark of the Covenant and it resides on top of that. So, uh, and it's supposed to be the resting place of God. So it's supposed to be completely pure. So uh, Acacia would apparently doesn't decay. So there's that kind of stuff, you know. And uh, then, so the Ark of the Covenant in Exodus 48, I think, is it 48? I've, I can't see. Oh, it's 40. Sorry. Yeah. Exodus 40. In Exodus 40, the Ark of the Covenant is uh, overshadowed by the Shekinah cloud, which is called the glory cloud. There's other instances that comes. Have any of you seen the movie Prince of Egypt or, uh, or Exodus or 
what's the other uh, one called? Ten Commandments? No? Yes? No? Maybe? Yeah, you may have seen like there's this huge kind of pillar of cloud and fire that comes up every now and then. That's called a shaking out cloud. It kind of makes its appearance every now and then. It's a visible sign of the presence of God, of the glory and power of God. So it happens when the temple is consecrated. It happens when um, the Ark of the Covenant is consecrated. The tabernacle is consecrated. It happens when Jesus is transfigured. There's a huge cloud that comes down. And the last time it's seen is, uh, is apparently when Jesus was taken up into heaven in this cloud. Right. Every time that happens, it's the glory cloud, you know. So but it also happens uh, when uh, the ark was overshadowed by the Shekinah cloud. And once that happened, the overshadowing happened, no one could enter the ark. Now, and uh, later on, at some point, uh, there was this ark was traveling to the hill country of Judea, uh, back into Israel and um, sorry, back into Judea. And it was almost about to fall off this cart. And some guy, uh, some random guy, I can't remember his name now, he kind of reached out and touched the ark and suddenly he died because he wasn't supposed to touch the ark. Uh, I think it is in 1 Kings 8 or 2 Samuel, it's in 2 Samuel 6 that that happens. Uh, the, uh, someone touches the ark and suddenly they die. So the, uh, the message was nobody unless they were a priest who was allowed and even they were not allowed to touch the ark itself. They were supposed to put a rod through some of the rings and they were supposed to carry the rod rather and the ark was lifted up like that you know. So even the Levites weren't supposed to touch the ark. So uh, and when this guy just touched it dead. Bam. You know and uh, then Later on in 2 Maccabees 2, there was a document that was found um, that was written by Jeremiah or Baruch. And it says uh, when Israel was plundered, when Judea was plundered by the Assyrians, Jeremiah took the ark uh, with a bunch of priests and they hid the ark in, in, some, uh, in some cave. And then later on when they tried to find it, when the people who went with Jeremiah tried to find it, they couldn't find it. So the Jews, later on the Jewish rabbis believed the ark was taken up into heaven to prevent any sort of uh, desecration by any foreigners uh, who didn't know what it was. Like, you know, they would have taken the ark, melted up the gold, all of those things, you know? So it was taken up into heaven. So, uh, okay. Now, that's a lot of information there. Now, Mary, the new Ark of the Covenant, just like the old Ark of the Covenant was made of pure wood, <laughs> that was only supposed to, uh, um, the old Ark of the Covenant was supposed to, uh, the, the glory of God, the glory cloud rested on it. It was a visible sign of God's presence, you know, and, but Mary, the new ark contained God herself, himself inside her, you know, it was God. So if you would, uh, like, it's a question that I've seen somewhere, like, you know, when someone denied uh, the Immaculate Inception, someone asked them, would you put your baby in a pile of dung? You know, uh, no, but so God wouldn't put himself who's pure, who's without sin, who's so pure that he cannot even be approached by people. Uh, would he put himself in, in an unworthy thing, in something that was sinful, you know? So uh, the, uh, that's the idea of the Immaculate Conception where uh, like it is God himself who resided in her. So uh, a, she was overshadowed by the power of the Most High in Luke um, 1, I think. Uh, Luke one, and uh, she was a perpetual <laughs> virgin. Like it said, like the old dark couldn't be touched by anyone once the overshadowing happened, you know? And it was like, um, yeah, the, the word overshadowed used, the Greek word used is actually a very strong word. It's a, it, um, it kind of symbolizes a, a very intimate relationship, you know? And also she was assumed into heaven, just like the old dark. Okay, why uh, was she assumed into heaven? So the answer is uh, in Revelation 12. In Revelation 11, uh, the, after Jeremiah hid the ark, nobody has ever seen the Ark of the Covenant. The next time it's seen is when John looks up into the heaven and the heavens open and the, he saw the Ark of the Covenant. And the next thing he sees is the woman again. The woman clothed in the sun, uh, standing over the moon with stars around her as a crown. So, um, and this woman gives birth to the child who's supposed to rule the nations with a scepter of iron, which is seen as Jesus, right? So uh, now this is another image that I found. This is in Poland. Uh, it's in the um, friary or pri friary, I think. It's the monastery established by St. Maximilian Kolbe. It's uh, a monstrance and it's hairy, you know? Uh, I thought this was a beautiful image. And if you guys wanna attend perpetual adoration, this is a way uh, they do per live online perpetual adoration online uh, in this chapel. Now, so 
this brings me to Kekare Tomene. So this is, uh, I joked to some people like, uh, ah, we're gonna name Lily Kekare Tomene, like, you know, but uh, it didn't, yeah, it didn't go over, over well. So Kekare Tomene is uh, basically means hail full of grace. All right, it's the, it's the Greek word Luke writes. So when the angel comes over, now this is where I wanna say is, sorry, oh, before, oh, okay. Before I go over this, let me just see where I am. And okay, yeah, great, great, great. So, um, so okay, yeah, uh, so this is um, when the angel Gabriel came to announce um, the, the um, conception of Jesus to Mary, what do you think the angel Gabriel did? Because usually when people see an angel, they're scared out of their minds because our minds cannot even conceive of the, um, of the, uh, we can't physically conceive of these spiritual beings, all right? They take weird shapes, like, you know, circling wheels with eyes on them, like beasts with four wings with eyes all over their body. Like, anytime you see an angel appear to anyone, it's not a cherub. It's not, it's not like a tiny baby with wings, or it's not a beautiful, like, you know, winged creature. These are winged creatures that are mentioned. They scare everyone. When the shepherds kind of saw them, they were scared. When anyone saw an angel, they were, like, terrified. You know, it's like, and, and that, uh, it also kind of hints at what they say. The first, the first thing that they say when they come into contact with humans, like fear not. And then everyone just screams louder. I said, fear not, you know, but uh, this is how usually um, uh, angelic appearances go over. And you can imagine that's why God decided, you know what, this isn't working out. I, I'll just send my mother from now on. So all the other uh, appearances after that were, gee, was Mary, like, you know, it's much less scary. So, but uh, when the angel Gabriel came over her, she greeted, he greeted her as Ave Kekari Tomene. So like hail full of grace. And it's not that uh, she was, it's not just that she was full of grace, it's like filled with grace for, from the moment she, was, she existed, but it's also that she, um, her name in the eyes of God, her identity in the eyes of God was full of grace. That was her name, Kakare, Kekare Tomene. So uh, that's how the angel, angel Gabriel addressed her. And this angel knew what this woman was, what this little girl, like, you know, maybe 14, 15 year old uh, girl was. She, as he came over, she was the mother of God, the son, all right? And this angel Gabriel, usually when uh, angels come over, they're like standing about in their full natural glory, like, you know, supernatural glory, like, you know, and people scared running. But in this case, Mary was dis disturbed after the angel's greeting, you know, and uh, not afraid. So the, uh, one of the speakers I've heard talk about this kind of said this, angel Gabriel was a smart angel, you know? So what he did, he knew that this little girl was supposed to be his boss at some point in the future. Maybe even like in a few seconds, because once she's the mother of God, who's the king of the universe, uh, everything changes, you know? So she, he came over there and he probably prostrated in front of her to, with his head to the floor, going, hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Uh, so uh, why is that? So in the Davidic kingdom, like I said, um, uh, Jesus is the son of David. It's mentioned all of the uh, time. So in the Davidic kingdom, the Davidic king had often had a lot of wives. So which one of them would be the queen? It would start a civil war or a family war, whatever. So, but he only had one mother. So usually every time in the, in the Davidic line every time a king is mentioned whether he was a good king or a bad king there were only three or four good kings so anytime there was a there was a king mentioned it was always his mother mentioned along with her or with him and uh like you see that in uh, one kings 119 when when the king solomon who came in uh who came riding to jerusalem on a donkey like that should ring some bells like you know who else came riding into jerusalem on a donkey you know, and uh, once he's crowned king, uh, the, uh, his mother comes over there with a petition uh, from his brother and uh, his mother comes over there. So what King Solomon does is he gets up, he bows down low in front of his mother because that's one of the commandments, honor your father and your mother. And then he gives his mother a throne on his right hand side. All right. So uh, and this uh, this was because the queen was the mother. 
it was a title, the Queen Mother, or it was in Hebrew, it was called the Gebura, uh, which means the Great Lady. So Mary being the mother of the son of David, who was not just the king of the Jews, not just the king of Israel, uh, or the king of the world, or the king of the universe, he was king of all creation, which includes the angels. So this angel knew who Mary was, you know, and he probably bowed down in front of her as he was greeting her. So now, uh, so Mary is the queen mother. You know, she's, uh, she is gentle. She's all of those like lovely, she's got all of those lovely feminine qualities that everyone loves about her. She's motherly, all of these things, but she's also the queen, the great lady. She's the woman of Genesis 3 and Revelation 12. In Genesis 3 and Revelation 12, the, uh, the serpent is mentioned, the great serpent, the ancient serpent, you know, uh, the one who caused the fall of the old Eve, you know, the, the original Eve. So Mary being the new Eve, uh, she's the woman, uh, uh, there's a, there, it's mentioned that a woman would crush his head, you know, and uh, the serpent would bruise uh, her son's heel. And in Revelation 12, another woman is mentioned who's like just protected by God throughout, like, you know, who's hidden by God from the serpent. And another word for serpent is the dragon. So you could almost call her the woman of Genesis 3 and Revelation 12, the dragon crusher, the serpent crusher, whatever you want to call her, like, you know. Um, she was the great lady. She was honored and favored by God. She, was the, she is the queen of heaven, the queen of the angels, and the mother of the church. Because... Uh, guess what the church is the church is the bride of christ the body of christ you know and she was present when uh, most church fathers believe that when uh when uh, when jesus was speared through the sight and blood wa and blood and water rushed through him those were the baptism waters that's when the church was born so just like eve came from adam's sight the same way the uh, the bride of Christ, Eve, who was Adam's bride, came from um, Adam's side. Uh, the same way the bride of Christ came from the new Adam's side, which was Jesus, you know, when his side was pierced. And uh, Mary was present during that time. And later on, when the Holy Spirit came during the inauguration of the church at Pentecost, she was there too, you know. Now, so this is all the great and amazing things about Mary. She's a completely badass lady. Like, you know, Bishop Barron has a talk about how she's the warrior queen who crushes the serpent's head, uh, not, by, not by her own power, but by the power of God. And uh, there's lots of exorcists who talk about how Mary's power comes from her humility and it's her total dependence on God. And her power, is, by her power alone, she's, is, she would be able to like rid the earth of all demons. Like, it's just that complete humility and trust in God. That's where her power lies, you know? And, uh, but, and if you think about it, that's what Mary says about herself too. Humility doesn't mean like she's kind of, ah, I'm nothing, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a nobody, that kind of thing. No, no, she's aware of her nothingness in front of God. Therefore, she goes, uh, like you read in the Magnificat today. What does the Magnificat start with? Sorry, <laughs> I forgot. Sorry, we do. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, soul magnifies oh yeah, my soul magnifies my Lord, um, magnifies God. The Lord, um, the, my soul rejoices in God. In, in God, my Savior. My soul rejoices in God, my Savior. So another thing is actually, so if Mary was without sin, she was immaculately conceived, did she need a Savior? And the answer is yes, she did, because she was also saved by the future merits of the death resurrection of her son. Uh, a philosopher called Don Scotus, um, talks about it it's like um most of us would be saved if we're saved by god hopefully uh, we are uh, would be it's like we fell into a pit and god kind of gives us his hand and pulls us out mary on the other hand was prevented from falling into the pit in both ways you're saved by god you know and that is the uh, uh that is one of the ways you can explain the immaculate conception if you don't believe in it or if you want to explain to someone else so now uh, um the next thing. So she, yeah, like I said, she's a badass lady, like Hail Mary, full of grace, points the devil in the face. So um, now she is also our queen because guess who's our king? It's supposed to be Jesus. And if Jesus is our king, we have to have Mary as our queen. Like, I don't think Jesus would stand for it if we didn't have Mary as our queen. And uh, like, uh, and she, but she's also our mother. And that's really important. The queen of heaven, the queen of the angels is our mother. In John 19, 26, uh, Jesus says like, behold your mother to John. And John took her into 
his home. Yeah. And uh, Pope John Paul II talks about how this is what should, our attitude should be towards Mary, how we should take her into our lives, into our inner lives, into our homes, and uh, how we should entrust ourselves to Mary, because the first person who entrusted himself to Mary was Jesus himself. As a baby, like, you know, he was completely helpless. He was a completely human baby. He had to be wiped. He had to be burped. He had to be, like, all of those things had to happen. And he entrusted Mary to do all of those things for him, you know? And, um, no, so, this is, and this is something that uh, uh, the you know, Mary as the Ark of the Covenant, fully pure, all of those things has been there since the early church. It's not something new that anyone came up with. St. Athanasius of Alexandria or St. Athanasius the Badass uh, also talks about Mary as, oh, noble virgin, truly, two seconds, sorry. Truly you are greater than any other greatness for who is your equal in greatness? O dwelling place of God, the word, to whom among all creatures shall I compare you, O virgin. You are greater than them all, O ark of the covenant, clothed with purity instead of gold. You are the ark in which is found the golden vessel containing the true manna, that is the flesh in which divinity resides. So this was something as early as uh, Saint Athanasius was present for uh, was present during the um, uh, during the Council of Nicaea, where people were debating whether Jesus was fully God or just man who became God or something along those lines. And uh, it was uh, the the idea of the Ark of the Covenant existed from then on, or actually from before that. You know, so now um, that being said, uh, what do we do? So. So one of the things with Mary is uh, Saint um, Lou de Montfort talks about the closest way to sainthood is actually Marian consecration. The, the easiest way, the quickest, surest and easiest way. Because uh, as the Catholic Church, we have to imitate Mary. We are supposed to be a type of Mary, like with this kind of full obedience and trust in God, just kind of there like Mary, just going, um, let your will be done unto me. Like we try to do, whether we're evangelizing, whether we're trying to do good things in our life, we try everything by our power. Mary, if you think about it, she changed the world more than anyone else. We just are one yes and all our future yeses too. But like, that's the thing. She trusted in God. She let God do the work. Imagine if we were a church of people who just let God do all the work through us. You know, if we always said yes to God through Mary and it's really hard. Uh, another thing that we have to understand is people who are dead, they're not really dead. They're, they're more alive if, if they're in heaven. I don't know what happens, else, but if they're in heaven, because they're closer to God, who's the author of, all, author of all life. So they're more fully alive. So Mary is closest to God by grace. And like if she's there uh, and she's closest to, uh, to the ear of the king, think about how much she can help us. You know, to become like Jesus, she gave birth to Jesus. She, uh, Jesus was formed in her womb. Uh, all the saints, all the saints, Marian theologians kind of talk about how we should let ourselves be formed in the image of Christ in Mary's womb. And these are all hard things to understand. But at the end of the day, if we can just entrust ourselves to Mary like, um, like Jesus did, you know, uh, that would be a sure path to holiness. Because Mary was the most closely united to the will of God in everything that she did and in everything that she was, you know, and she wants the salvation of all of us, just like a mother for her children. Now, uh, so if we can kind of end uh, with two prayers and uh, we'll kind of go from there. So if we can all say this prayer um, with uh, just pause and say it slowly with the full intention of honoring Mary as the mother of our Lord. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among all women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Now, Amen. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of mercy. Hail our life, and speak in our hope. In our hope. To thee do we cry, our poor banished children of God. To thee do we send up our sighs, morning and evening, in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, and act mercy towards us. 
and I can have the rest of 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 do you have any questions? If I don't know the answer, I will tell you I, that I don't know the answer. Do you have any Indeed, I mean, uh, we were going to ask you: uh, Are you okay with taking? Are you okay with taking questions? But yeah, uh, since you said yes to it already, <laughs> we'll ask you the questions. I think uh, Angela, did you get any questions from anyone? Oh yeah, if you have any questions, you can post them in the chat. We can try answer them for you guys. If now we knows the answer, we can try. If you if you don't, if not, know I refer you to um, authors or people who would know the answer. Indeed, most of course, yeah. <laughs> um, I think one question that I've kind of heard um, from other people, and I've had this for a few years as well, is that why do we give so much importance to the rosary, um, especially in like Catholic households? Um, so you know, are we like sometimes people feel like we're giving way too much importance to Mother Mary. So would you like to kind of talk about that? Yeah, yeah. Um, the question we have is like, um, do we push Mary about God? And uh, I don't know, maybe people do that sometimes. I recently heard of a heresy where people were thinking of Mary as God. That is a heresy, by the way. Uh, I don't remember what it's called, actually, but um, it is a heresy to think of Mary as God or to put her before God. But at the same time, uh, with respect to the rosary, um, so it starts with the Annunciation and ends with the Coronation. And all of those things are basically just biblical reflections. So Mary is like, oh, it's, it's almost like... Um, going through Jesus's life from his conception to uh, the final glorification of all his flesh through the eyes of Mary, who was I've closest to him. Like a photo album. Mary showing a photo album yeah. of Jesus. Yeah. Jennifer just said, like, you know, it's like Mary showing us a photo album of Jesus Christ. So if you're supposed to engage in contemplative prayer, like, you know, um, and now that's, this is something that I, always make the mistake of, like, I don't pray the rosary contemplatively. We just kind of go, Henry, you know, it's like it's so fast. But the way it's supposed to be, actually, like, um, the, the Hail Mary is just, we're saying the word of God over and over again, and we're asking Mary to help us out. And, um, uh, and the thing is, uh, reflecting on the life of Jesus with Mary in the rosary. And Mary is, you could say she's the masterpiece of God's creation. So you could praise Mary, but in fact, you're praising the artist who's God. Not praise Mary as in worship Mary, but like praise her for who she is, because uh, the, for what she is, because she is the masterpiece of God's creation. Uh, by, by nature, she's just a simple human like any of us. But by grace, she's elevated to the highest point of creation after God. You know, so, well, who's the creator? So, yeah. Uh, now, the other thing is actually, may, like I said it's before. Like a spiritual weapon, like the, 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 the rosary is like the great, one of the greatest spirits, sorry, I'm like way far away. The rosary is like one of the greatest spiritual weapons, like saying the name of Mary uh, terrorizes the devil. Um, it's something I read. I can't remember which saint said that, mm. but like just saying the name of Mary, um, obviously praying the Hail Mary would be amazing. But if you even just say the name of Mary, demons fly away or de not fly, flee away. Um, so like definitely like something uh, on a personal note, like um, like a lot of times when, you know, I, I just tempted to think like stupid stuff, you know, like, or just temptations to like feel insecure or whatever. Like we all have different things that distract us um, from our, like our, our goal of holiness. Just say Mary and like the immediately, like there's that consolation that the devil is just going to run away. Cause he's like, he just is so scared of Mary. He's like terrified of Mary because she is everything that he's not, you know, like, um, the, this like Satan fell because of his pride and Mother Mary is anything but her humility is something he can never never have you know yeah what were you going to say about the uh, yeah so Mary is um, Daniel kind of said this to me like no so Mary is uh, is the great helper 
you know so she yeah just like she was with the apostles like think about this okay this is a story now i don't know if you remember in there's a part in um in luke's gospel where john's kind of kind of walking around uh and he sees someone preaching in the name of jesus and john suddenly is so angry like you know he's like he kind of runs to jesus and goes yeah yeah there's another guy who's preaching in your name like you know what should we do like what do we do here like you know and he's like just calm down john it's okay like you know john's a kid at that time and then later on like you know uh, some people don't let jesus enter uh, the samaritan towns don't let jesus enter into the town and john again kind of goes like shall we call fire down from heaven lord and jesus is like Will you calm down please like you know so uh that's not what he says but it's it's almost like that and then later on john's like the, the gentlest guy ever He's always talking about love and how he's like, you know, how he just has to be before God in total love. And he's a disciple who feels so loved. Guess who John had throughout his life with him after the death of Jesus? It was Mary. Like, you know, it's almost like Mary's influence on John just coming and making him like, like her, you know, and like Jesus, in fact. And uh, so Mary is a, a great helper, you know, and, uh, yeah, you just have to believe in Jesus to uh, to uh, to be saved. But it sure does help to know who Jesus is and who know to know who His mother is. You know, because there are a lot of other things. Uh, the the reason the church is so strict about the teachings on Mary is because it protects who Jesus is. So is that is that is that okay? Do do, uh, do you? Yeah, thank you. Well, for that. just to add just to add a word to your wonderfully answered question. I think sometimes when people ask me this question, I just tell them, you're asking a question that you yourself, you're a victim of. Because if you look at our life generally, we always give emphasis to things that are not really the thing we are concerned about. You meet a student, he's talking about school, I'm going to school, I'm going to school, but the emphasis is knowledge. But he's always talking about school. We're all talking about hand, hand sanitizers, face masks, hand sanitizers, face masks. The emphasis is the coronavirus. We're talking about football, Chelsea, Liverpool, Manchester United. The emphasis is entertainment. We're talking about clothing, jeans, uh, boxers, trousers, shirt, t-shirt, necktie, suit. The emphasis is just self-covering. So everything about the society, emphasis are always placed on things, but they are not in themselves the, the main issue we're talking about iPhone 7, iPhone 8, iPhone 11 Plus, uh, Samsung this, uh, Infinix that. The emphasis is just having a mobile phone that you can make calls and access the internet. So we have always had this, we have always had the attitude to other things of life. So when it comes to respect for Mary and we make such talk about Mary, devotions to Mary, song, we sing songs to Mary, the emphasis is still Jesus Christ. So, just as we emphasize things, but the main issue our uh, concern is just behind it. So that's how we also just naturally find ourselves having such natural emphasis on Mary, but we know all we see about her, all we think about her, all we think about her is as a result of the simple fact that she's the mother of Jesus. Without being the mother of Jesus, nobody have even known that there was a girl ever born in Israel with the name Mary. So. All you talk about Mary is because of Jesus Christ. So any emphasis we make, I am an Irish citizen, I am an Italian, I'm a Spanish. The emphasis is just what? Citizenship. So I think it is a natural tendency as human beings that we always emphasize something as it relates to the main thing. We have never emphasized the main thing in itself. I was in a three-star restaurant. I was in a five-star restaurant. The emphasis is just food. Either you ate the food in a, in a, in a, in a brokeable plate or on a, on, on, a, on a platter of gold, it's still food. But people want to talk about, I was in this big restaurant or that restaurant. At the end of it all, the emphasis boiled back to the fact that we ate food. So emphatic stress is part of our human nature and we can't help but do that. So there's nothing wrong having that dimension when it comes to our mother Mary. Thanks, Father. I think we have a few questions in the chat. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So the next question is from uh, is regarding why is Mary a perpetual virgin? I actually don't know the answer to why, but uh, even even the uh, the concept of perpetual virginity it was only made clear to me very recently. It was um, so there's a there's an order in Mallow where my parents live. Um, they are called the um, 
seven brothers of the uh, home of the mother. One of their charisms is to defend the virginity of Mary, the provisional virginity of Mary. And one of the priests, uh, priests told me, like, I believe that she was a virgin, as in, like, she never had any sexual relations with anyone. But virginity is also, like, a physical thing, you know? And uh, what he said was actually, like, during birth itself, God opened up her womb for Jesus to come through. So it was almost like, uh, like there was, uh, there was no... Um, there was no change in uh, the, uh, the physical situation of her body from her birth to her, um, to her death. She was a virgin from birth to, to death and onto heaven, you know? So, um, and um, the reason is because she was uh, consecrated to God. So once she was overshadowed by the cloud, no man, just like the Ark of the Covenant, no man could enter. And if any man touched, <clears throat> dead, you know? And, uh, and, Joseph would have known, you know, that story of Uzzah uh, yeah, from 1 Samuel, like, you know, and um, there's a story behind uh, how Joseph and Mary, uh, kind of their marriage, uh, which is, and it's a biblical story. It's a really good story, like, you know, maybe we could talk about it at some point. Uh, it's basically like Joseph and Mary were both virgins and they had a consecrated Josephite marriage, it's called, you know, so it is a, it is a beautiful story. So I hope that kind of answers the question. Like, you know, uh, it just was fitting. That's the answer that I've heard. Is, is that okay, Helen? Is, is Helen, is it your question or is it someone else's? Or... No, 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 it was my question. It was just because, um, like you said, she was, uh, you know, the new Ark of the Covenant. But mm -hmm. then, you know, like, her role was, like, if we were to look at it, you know, her, we could see that her role was only to kind of, like, bring Jesus into the world. As in, like, if we look look at it from, like, a... Uh, like mm -hmm. from the story of the Bible, and then, yeah. um, like her virginity was only needed up until that point, so mm. that, um, yeah, so then, like, after Jesus was born, you know, like, did she need to be pure? Like, did she need to be as, uh, about need to be? I don't know. I don't know, but the church teaches that she was. Again, uh, the reason is she belonged to God and to God alone. You know, yeah. it was a complete consecration to God. She, like, um, okay, this is the story that I wasn't going to say because, um, like, there wasn't any time. But one of the church fathers tells this kind of story of, do you know how um, in Revelation, the dragon's like, like just waiting for Mary to give birth so he can consume the child. So this dragon has been afraid since Genesis 3, 15 of this woman who's going to bear the son of God and who's going to crush his head. So he's, he would have been looking, uh, like the devil would have been looking all over the world for the word. There was another prophecy uh, just before Hezekiah's, uh, the king Hezekiah's birth about how the virgin will uh, conceive and give birth, you know? So this dragon was looking for a virgin woman who was supposed to bring, uh, bring forth this child. Um, and Mary uh, had consecrated herself as a temple virgin to God uh, well before marrying Joseph. And later on, the priest found out that she had to be married through a vision and they, they found a husband who was Joseph and they were married. And after their marriage was when uh, the Bible says betrothal, but in Jewish tradition, betrothal is the first uh, marriage happens in two steps. One is the ceremony, which is called the betrothal. And the second thing is actually when the husband takes the wife into his home. Those are the two parts of a marriage ceremony. So she was already legally married to Joseph. That's why the Bible says Joseph was trying to divorce her because he was already married. You know, and by law, if you had another child, if she was uh, another child, he was required. But also, um, so because Mary was married to Joseph and Jesus was born in their wedlock, so legally the son of Joseph, uh, the devil almost overlooked Mary and God used it's just the fact that Mary had consecrated herself as a virgin, so she could never become the mother of God. She would never be uh, the maid who conceived uh, to give birth to the king, you know? So God used that part, that impossibility. That's why Mary goes, how can this be? I'm a virgin. Like, you know, it's not that I'm a virgin. No, I'm going to be a virgin. This is, I promised, I, I made a vow, you know? And no, no, no. And God says, no, no, no. The angel says, no, no, no. For God, everything is possible, and then the Holy Spirit overshadowed her, and she conceived. So, um, so why was uh, why was it necessary that she she be like remain a virgin after birth? She was physically a virgin through the birth, 
you know that's what the church teaches that's how important it is like you know uh, so if you're asking me why she needed to be i actually don't know apart from the fact that she was consecrated to god and she belonged to god so i hope that satisfies uh, i'm i'm fairly certain other people have better answers for it like you know i mean yeah i'll try and find something and send something to you helen if that's okay yeah um just one more thing i was just going to say um does, did that mean that mary couldn't sin in any sort of way like she she just physically couldn't um because she was a virgin or because she like, was immaculate because conceived? yeah because she was immaculately conceived that's a good question actually so um name another woman who was immaculately conceived actually who was without sin from the moment of her existence at the moment of her existence mm -hmm. Eve. Eve, yeah, good answer. So uh, that's the thing. So, but Eve sinned, right? The, uh, the thing is, uh, uh, just because she was immaculately conceived, she was free from original sin, doesn't mean um, um, she didn't have the freedom. Like she didn't have free will. Right. Sorry, that might mistake, free will. But being as humble and full of grace as she was, she used her freedom not to, not kind of like a freedom to do whatever she wants. It's basically like a freedom for doing what is good. You know, she's like a perfect embodiment of what the church should be. Mm -hmm. So that that is the thing. So uh, like in every way, she was like everyone else, like, you know, but she used her freedom, the free will that God gave her to do what is good, to, to, to do his will, not just what is good, to actually do his will. So, yeah. Um, just, sorry, just to kind of interrupt there. Um, I see that people are kind of trickling out. So we can continue on the questions and answers. Um, but just before we kind of lose more people, um, just to let you know about next week, we have um, Phoebe, who's going to share her testimony about how she, um, how she, um, what am I saying? Uh, came into Catholicism from um, being a Protestant. So if you guys are interested in knowing her story and her journey, do come along next week. Um, yeah, so just to kind of make that announcement. Um, and yeah, we can continue on with the questions and answers, but people are free to go if they want. I actually had another thing to say, just one more thing. Uh, so in Psalm 16, it says like, you know, you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made, uh, yeah. So the, the, one of the, um, one of the problems with uh, one of the curses of original sin was, uh, was pains of childbirth and uh, death. So both of those things, Mary didn't have to go through because she was free from original sin or any sin for that matter, you know? So um, in that regard, like uh, the church believes that she didn't have any pains during childbirth, but all of those were saved for later when Jesus gave birth to the mystical, by gave birth, like Jesus uh, brought forth the mystical body, uh, brought forth his mystical body or his bride. So during that, that pain, the sword that pierced her heart, that uh, like, it didn't happen during childbirth, but it happened later. But also there is this thing recently um, people have come up with, there's this thing that mothers have called micro, uh, sorry, fetal microchimerism. It's basically where uh, the fetus's body parts kind of travel throughout the, uh, the mother, you know, and uh, they, uh, like long after the fetus is, uh, the baby is born. So uh, there, there are fetal cells and DNA all over the mother. So Mary had only one son and she, uh, he was her flesh and blood, obviously, but she also had his flesh inside him, inside her, you know? And just like Jesus was glorified and taken up into heaven, Mary without sin was totally taken up into heaven. So um, there's, uh, there's two accounts of the assumption. I, don't know which to believe in one she dies and in the other she kind of goes through a death-like sleep so it's really interesting if you want to read about it at some point i think i think i think we need to understand something when we talk about mary being a virgin all her life or mary not committing actual sin we must understand even in modern terms we have things like uh, 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 vaccines where people are given injections and they they, they can they are immune to a lot of things so like you, you, you said during the, the talk, it was called uh, Kekari Tomine, full of grace, full of grace to what? Full of grace to holiness, full of grace to faithfulness, full of grace to simplicity, full of grace to prayer, full of grace to salvation. And that's why the church always says that Mary experienced the grace of salvation even before the crucifixion, because the angel acknowledged the fact that she was so favored 
she was so favored that Elizabeth filled with the Holy Spirit would say, why am I honored that the mother of my Lord should come to visit me? The mother of salvation should come to visit me. So that fullness of grace was a gift from God that immune her from sin, that immune her from human frailty and human mistakes. All of us today that are making the, the Christian claim that are Christians, we, we don't claim to be perfect by a human effort. It's not because we are so conscious and careful that we try to live decent life and healthy life or have good relationship with people. It's because we try to live within the grace of God. Uh, the inclinations, the thinking, the tendencies are always there in us. But we control them through grace, through prayers. And so if Mary had received the fullness of grace, then it shouldn't be a problem for us in understanding that she had the divine ability to be able to live in human experience without experiencing the human frailty. And this was possible because grace was given to her. And Mary could not even understand that reality. That's why the angel Gabriel reminded her, with God, all things are possible. Look, one Mary should have said, no, I don't think I can live without making mistakes. I don't think I can live without, I, I, I don't think I can live with Joseph as his wife without submitting myself to him as a woman. But angel Gabriel told her, look, with God, all things are possible. So whatever mission God has called you to accomplish in your life, you're able to accomplish them. All that the Lord is asking for is to say what? I am the handmaid of the Lord. Be done unto me according to your words. And the angel left because the mission was already accomplished. Yeah. Um, Let me, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, 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 can I ask a question, Angela? Yeah? Can I ask a question? Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> uh, so, um, Naveen, you mentioned, uh, you know, the how the Ark of the Covenant was desecrated, like, um, like on the journey, I think. Did you mention that? Or did I hear it wrong? No, I didn't say desecrated. It was just touched by a guy, yeah. Okay, sure, yeah. Um, or, you know, how it was let, then later um, kept hidden and things that. And there was like, you know, um, so the question is like, um, Oh, but yeah, the question was actually the question that was sent to me by a partisan was like, how would the Ark of the Covenant be uh, desecrated, you know, since it cannot be touched by man? Uh, so why would it need to be assumed to heaven since God resides in it? So that's the question I got from a participant, by the way. Um, by, oh, sorry, what? Say the question again. Uh, so the question is, how would the Ark of the Covenant be desecrated um, since uh, it cannot be touched by man? So why would it need to be assumed into heaven since God resides in it? Um, it could be it could be a thing slightly that the person heard it wrong, but yeah, you could probably clarify. Yeah, that. so uh, I'll try and explain the Ark of the Covenant uh, again as best as I can. So the Ark of the Covenant was the box that was uh, the box. Okay, sorry, it was the Ark. Okay, yeah, it was it was it looked like a box, I guess. Yeah, so it was uh, so it contained um, three things: the the mana, the um, the the rod of Aaron, and um, the, the word of God, the tablets of the Ten Commandments, all three things symbolized um, the word of God, the bread that um, the bread that came down from heaven, and um, the, the priest. priest. So um, now, the, once it was consecrated in Exodus twenty-five, the glory cloud came over it and recited over it. You know, at a certain point, um, like, and the temple was supposed to be always holy, but the prophecy was everything in the temple would be taken out, like, you know, like, people, everything would be looted. And you later on see that, like, you know, things that were consecrated for divine use was used by one of the Assyrian kings to just kind of drink and have a party, like, you know, so, um, and he was punished for it too. So the thing is, the Ark of the Covenant was, was in the Holy of Holies, like, you know, only the high priest could enter, and that too, once a year. You know, and uh, and like it was a dangerous job to be a high priest in Israel. So uh, the thing is, um, Jeremiah was told to carry the ark and hide it. That's that's uh, that's what uh, that's what two Maccabees um, chapter something I don't remember uh, two Maccabees seven I think uh, says. You know, Jeremiah was told to hide it, and then later on, one of the people who hid with Jeremiah tried to go back and mark the route, but they couldn't find the place or the thing. You know, so the later on, uh, uh, Jeremiah himself goes, later on, the ark will be showed in the fullness of time when God will unite everyone together. You know, the ark will be revealed again. 
so and it kind of makes sense that later on like you know it's when jesus is born who's kind of uniting who's starting the great gathering like you know uh in the catholic church uh, through the church like that's when the art comes up again you know uh but this time it's a woman but the thing is uh, or the jewish rabbis later on believe because when so after they returned the temple was built but there was no ark though you know so they believed that the ark was just taken by god into heaven like you know that's what they believed actually uh i don't know why but it's basically like you know so this was something consecrated it was supposed to uh the uh the glory of god was supposed to sit on the mercy seat and the foreigners they they might take it they might destroy it like you know i don't know what would happen again it's like um aslan says in narnia in uh, in the books in narnia like you know what could have happened there's no point in thinking about it like you know what did happen was jeremiah took mm. it away and the jews believed that it was up in heaven and later on john talks about how it's already up in heaven you know mm. it was taken up in heaven so uh, like the, about why uh, or, or a question needs to be answered with oh maybe if it didn't go what could have happened but that's what they thought would have happened that's why they hit it you know so mm-hmm.